<laughs> All right. If my screen is accurate, we are successfully online. Uh, hopefully, people can see us. Um, if not, we're just going to have a conversation by ourselves. Uh, so if you haven't joined one of these before, this is the third one I've done. Uh, my name is Mark Benson. <laughs> I am a solar system ambassador, which is a really cool title that NASA gives, uh, which basically just means people there tell me things. And then I come and tell schools or public events and try to make it so everyone can understand as best as possible. And uh, my guest today is uh, Michael Staub. He is on your screen, the other screen over there. He's the one with the glasses. Uh, oh, wait, that doesn't work. <laughs> He's the one with the shuttle launching behind him. Uh, he works for NASA. He does. He has a, He's going to give you a good rundown of his background and uh, what he does for them. Um, but he has been involved with some incredible missions, uh, the Cassini mission, which if any of you have followed me on here, you know that I talk a lot about Cassini and Saturn. Uh, he's involved with rovers on Mars and many other things. Um, so we're going to let him introduce himself. So Michael, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so my name is Michael Staub. Um, I'm currently a flight system systems engineer out here at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory working on a Earth orbiting mission called NISAR that uh, is part of our uh, sort of climate monitoring system of satellites that we have that are tracking things uh, like ocean temperatures and uh, glacial melting and various things like that that Earth scientists care about. Um, but in my previous life out here, uh, I started as a, uh, I was one of the flight controllers for Cassini. Uh, during the last phase of the mission we called um, the grand finale and just a, a little bit of a couple months lead up into the start of the grand finale. Um, and then after Cassini met its fiery end, I uh, became a flight director for the Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity and was with that mission until Mars decided that Opportunity needed to go to sleep <laughs> for good after 15 years. Um, so that's yep. how uh, that's how I then got, uh, got moved over to, uh, to the NISAR mission. Okay, cool. So yeah, we're gonna get into uh, each of those uh, each of those missions uh, individually. We'll talk about uh, how Oppy met its its sad. And however, it lasted a lot longer than I believe it was originally intended. So uh, so not too sad. Although I, I love the idea that someday an astronaut might go and reboot the thing uh, and take a picture of himself with it. Um, so let's uh, one question that people ask every time I do one of these, um, whether it's a research scientist or someone doing engineering or piloting. Um, one of the questions that always comes in and certainly came in this time was a um, little bit about your background, how you got interested in this type of work in the first place. Was it something you did? You've always known as a kid you want to be involved in this that happened later. What maybe spurred you? And then a little bit about your educational background, what you studied. Um, people want to know how do I get to be doing a job like you? So, uh, so let's, let us know how you got started. <laughs> um, so my parents will always say that I had a fascination with space when I was young. Um, although I'll say that the sort of the, I had kind of two defining moments, uh, when I was a kid that kind of, kind of steered me towards like what I'm doing now and, and why I love it so much. Um, the first was, uh, July 4th, 1997. Um, I was seven. Seven. I was seven at the time, um, and how was it seven? No, I would have been eight. Math I would have been eight. Yeah. Right. Math, basic math is hard for engineers. You know, we do calculus, yeah. differential equations, things like that. Yeah, yeah, arithmetic. Basic thing, math yeah. is difficult. Um, so I was eight, and July fourth of nineteen ninety seven, um, Independence Day, also happened to be the landing of the Pathfinder mission. So Pathfinder was a sort of a, a pretty high risk mission that NASA JPL decided to to undertake as part of Dan Golden, who was the NASA minister at the time, his sort of faster, better, cheaper approach. And this was, an, uh, this was a, a way to sort of do tech demonstration for mobility systems for rovers on the surface of Mars, as well as prove that NASA, which hadn't landed anything on the surface of Mars in 21 years, that we could still do it and we could do it cheaply and we could do it well. Um, so I was at my grandparents' house and we had CNN up and they were broadcasting this live from Mission Control at JPL and was watching this yeah. and was just like, wow, that's so cool. You're seeing images of something that's 300 million miles away landing on the surface of Mars and you're watching it in real time. And I remember that watching the engineers who were working that, that, 
that in that in Michigan trial, I was like, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. And at that point, it yeah. pretty much was like, I want to build spacecraft. I want to build spacecraft to go to Mars and go to other planets. Um, it's kind of neat that uh, I've actually gotten to work with several of those engineers who were the leaders on the Pathfinder mission here at JPL. Uh, Rob Manning, right. uh, Jen Trosper, yeah. Tracy Drain, a lot of people who were part of the uh, the development team for Pathfinder, who then went on to design the Murr rovers and then went on to design MSL and then Mars 2020. <laughs> um, had a chance to right. work with those people. So I think it was it was really neat that as a kid, I got to watch that. And then it's like, now I actually work <laughs> with these people. Um, so the yeah. second, uh, the, the second um, part that kind of got me into this um, was, I think it was October, I think it was Oct October 27th, October 28th of 1998. Um, there was a, a guy named John Glenn who got launched on the space shuttle and um, uh, right. My elementary, elementary school class, uh, we went to the library to watch his launch. And I'd never seen a space shuttle launch before. I, um, I remember watching the landing of Pathfinder, and I really got interested in the space stuff then. But I hadn't seen a space shuttle yeah. launch before. And, you know, we're sitting there watching this little tiny TV, and we're, we, we see the space shuttle. We see the, uh, the main engines go off, and then we see the rocket boosters, the, the SRBs light, and yeah. the thing just takes off. And you know, you're seeing the videos from inside, and like, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And at that point, I was like, okay. I'm going to build spacecraft that can fly to other planets, and then I want to be yeah. an astronaut. I want to go fly on the thing and actually <laughs> go do the real cool stuff up in space and on orbit. And uh, you know, since since John Glenn's gone up, you know, we've we've had the International Space Station has been in orbit, occupied for over 20 consecutive years. That's that's incredible. There's some people, right. there's some some high yeah. schoolers on the planet who have <laughs> never known a time when there hasn't been a human being who's been living in space. That's just on so the space cool. Station, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, those, those two moments kind of really defined, um, you know, wanting to be an engineer, wanting to work in the space industry, wanted to, you know, pursue the, uh, the ability maybe someday to become an astronaut. It's, it's very competitive. There's a lot of really great people who apply. Like, you look at the class of people who apply, and it's just like any one of those people would be incredible ambassadors and incredible astronauts, and they all would do a great right. job. So um, we just had a, a new application that, that closed uh, just about a month ago. Um, so, you know, it's about a year and a half process before we find out. So, um, you know, if I got selected, it would be an amazing opportunity, but if I don't, you know, I, there's still so many cool things you can do in the space right. industry, whether it's for NASA or whether it's for the, uh, whether it's for uh, commercial space or whether it's for, um, uh, for the department of defense. Um, so my background, uh, educational background. So I'm an aerospace engineer, so I'm a formerly trained rocket scientist by trade, um, I got a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Wichita State University. So I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, which okay. is the air capital of the world. Lots of airplanes. Um, <laughs> I'll make a, a little pitch here. There's a, an incredible museum in Hutchinson, Kansas, which is about an hour drive to the northwest of Wichita, Kansas. And this place has the largest collection of U.S. space memorabilia, be it spacecraft or rockets or, or spacesuits, outside of the Smithsonian, yeah. and it has the largest collection of okay. Soviet-era space hardware outside of Moscow. It is an incredible place. I went there for space camp. I was a space camp counselor there. I took lots of school yeah. trips up to the Cosmosphere. So I had a lot of um, I had a lot of inspiration when I was growing up uh, around space yeah. and things that got me really interested in it. Um, so back to it, I went, uh, I have a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Wichita State. Um, go shockers. <laughs> um, I have a master's degree in aerospace engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology. And I am uh, currently in a PhD program here at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles studying astronautical engineering. So specifically space engineering. Okay. That, that's a lot of, and so still doing school. Yeah, I still would, doing uh, school. I would imagine, yeah. Uh, so I just uh, so we're going to talk about some of the things in a little bit. We're going to talk we're, again. We're going to get to a lot of these in a, in a row here. We're going to talk about some of the astronaut stuff a little bit later. I just saw that one of my friends jumped on here and uh, she would she she I think she wants to be an astronaut. So uh, she's trying to figure out if someone who's thirty seven and works as a librarian can be an astronaut. And I, I think I think so. Why not? Um, but I'm glad uh, she's here. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, oh before we get we're going to talk about Cassini first. So we're going to kind of warm that one up, but. Um, are you able to do a lot of your work now from home? 
Um, the vast majority of us, yes. Um, there are okay. a couple teams, and, and the one that really is the one that can't work from home is Mars 2020. Um, the Perseverance rover, that mission is within three months, so within 90 days of yep. launch. So those that team is down at the Cape. <clears throat> They're getting the the rest of okay. the rover integrated and stacked in the in the uh, in the launch uh, capsule. So we have the entry capsule. So they're stacking everything together. They're filling it up with propellant. They're closing out the the last of the sort of the verification and validation activities that we have to do. And uh, once that's done, they're going to stack it on top of the Atlas V. They're going to take it out to the pad and they got to launch it because um, some some people may not be aware that when it comes to launching spacecraft to Mars. You have a three-week window, roughly 21 days, every 26 months to launch to Mars. That's because the energies from Earth to Mars line up such that our launch vehicles have enough energy to boost the spacecraft out of Earth orbit on a trajectory, on a trajectory to Mars. If we miss that window, kind of like what happened with Inside in 2016, we had to sit on the ground for 26 months and wait for the window to open up again. So the highest priority right. for NASA right now is to get... Um, well, there's there's probably two. Highest priority is uh, DM2, which we learned today is uh, scheduled to launch May 27th. Is is the target? Yes, we absolutely want to talk about so, that. So uh, DM2 yeah. and Mars 2020. Those I think are the two big priorities for NASA right now. Um, so the the okay. the rest of the Mars 2020 team, they are um, finishing the rest of uh, operations planning, uh, training. They're just getting themselves ready um, for the launch in July. So that's kind of the the big thing. Right. The rest of us. So we got a picture of um. We got a picture here, real quick, just so people know that's uh. If unless I uh, unless I grab the wrong picture, that should be uh Mars twenty twenty, um, which is now. That, yeah, that's perseverance. Um. Yep, that's perseverance. Uh, yeah, that's perseverance. Uh, or yep. Percy. Uh, I'm glad they named it. Um, because I, you know, when I was holding events, it was really easy to just ask kids. You know, so they have this thing called Mars twenty twenty. When do you think it's going to launch? Uh, most people could guess that pretty quickly. So I'm glad they gave it a name. Um, you know, so we, first, we, we, we heard the name and, you know, sometimes it takes us a little bit to get used to the name, but given what's going on right now, yeah. Perseverance is the perfect name. It is the perfect name for this right. mission. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, I, I was um, on the group that was, um, I was on one of the judges for names. So I got like 100 or 200 names, you know, submitted that I would go through and kind of rank and give points to based on creativity or how the, how it applies to the mission. And saw a lot of great names. I, I do like, I think when I first saw Perseverance Chosen, I thought, well, that's long. But, you know, opportunity is long, but Oppie is short and Percy mm -hmm. is short, but it, it, it works. It's it's a good word. It works really well. So as long as we're on Perseverance here, let's 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 linger on Perseverance for a moment. Um, what can you tell us about Perseverance for, you know, so I've, I've had a few people ask me and say, okay, well, it looks a lot like Curiosity. So is it just going to kind of drive around like Curiosity does? It's basically going to be Curiosity 2.0. I mean, what, what's Well, different? that's kind of how, that's kind of how uh, 2020 was pitched. It was pitched as sort of an MSL 2.0. In, in engineering terms, we call it sort of a build to print. So we can use the same sort of architecture, the same components. A lot of the materials are inherited, so we don't have to redesign things because why would we reinvent something when it's already built? We know it works. Um, right. So the 2020, most of the, a lot of the hardware is the same. The instruments are different, um, but the mission is is really the, the key. That's that's the piece that's different than MSL. So MSL is, <clears throat> is designed to look for sort of the chemistry, the chemistry that makes, um, that, that could, indicate signs of past life on Mars. So not necessarily it's looking for things like amino acids, but it's looking for the chemical indicators of life on Mars. The uh, Mars 2020 mission is directly designed as a bio detection mission. So it itself cannot detect life, but it's, it's being sort of coined as that. So the idea is that it okay. has better instruments to look more specifically for those chemical signatures, those byproducts of, of, past life that might have existed on Mars within the ge within the geology of the rocks that it's looking at. And then it has this very unique instrument on board mm -hmm. called the sample caching system. And that instrument is designed to take core samples of the Martian soil around the area that it's studying. It's going to cap those and it's going to leave them on the surface for another mission that we are uh, currently in the proposal stage called Mars Sample Return, MSR. And MSR is sort of this decades-long mission that is going to go to Mars. It's going to land. It's going to go pick up those samples. 
It's going to put them on a rocket. It's going to launch them into Earth orbit or into Martian orbit. We're going to have a satellite come and grab those samples, spiral out of Martian orbit, and then interf and then hit a trajectory to interface with the Earth atmosphere and return those samples to Earth. Right. That is sort of a, a science campaign that has been in the works for probably three plus decades. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, with the sample uh, sample collection, it sounds like you know looking for um, you know clues towards life is a big part of what these, this mission is going to do. Is this also the rover that's going to have? the uh the drone flying the helicopter on it. yes everyone likes yeah. to know about the helicopter yep okay uh technology yeah. demonstration mission it is a follow-on so it is uh it's just tagging along with with percy it's not yeah it's not part of the mission it's not like if it doesn't work it doesn't mean that the mission kind of failed in any sense it's just a technology right, demonstrator. Right. so you know the idea of yeah. being able to fly on Mars. Well, that's really difficult. Mars only has an atmosphere that has a pressure about one one hundredth of, of sea level here on Earth. So, zero point one percent, or one percent, one percent of the Earth atmosphere is at is at the surface on Mars. It's a very thin atmosphere. Right. So you have to talk about this very light sort of vehicle, and it's sort of like a CubeSat almost. And you have to take these carbon fiber blades and spin them extremely fast to generate enough lift to even fly to sea. But it's meant as a technology demonstrator, and it should be really cool. Like, right. uh, I, I think, um, I think in terms of the mission, that little helicopter is going to be what the Sojourner rover was to Pathfinder. <clears throat> it's going to be the thing that everybody's okay. talking about because wouldn't it be so cool to see video from? Uh, from this thing as it's flying around on Mars, as like it's flying, that. an just, aerial that shot of this moving, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's and there's definitely value in that too, even if it's just a demonstration that um, people to see that to be to be able to capture that video and, and to see it and just you know inspire. You know, you talked about the things that inspired you when you were little. You know, someone might be sitting at home and and see that aerial shot. Of of flying around Mars, and that might be the moment. That might be the thing that decide that catches them, and they decide, "Oh man, I remember when I was a kid and I saw that thing flying around Mars, and I thought I need to learn how to pilot something yeah. on Mars." So uh, that you know, hopefully it'll it'll have that kind of an impact, and hopefully it'll work. Um, but uh, yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds uh, pretty neat. Um, so hopefully that. So when does that launch uh, this year? I don't remember if you mentioned the date. Is that Jul July seventeenth? That is when the window uh, the window okay, opens July on 17th. July seventeenth. Okay, and arrival at the end of the year. Um, or we, well, I think now beginning think of next year. Is, I think that would probably is February twenty third. February twenty third of next year. Okay, yeah. Okay, so a little over a little over seven okay, months good. to get there. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so uh, again, you know, if you have questions, if you're logging on, um, you can click them on the side here. You know, if you have questions about something we talked about before, we'll go back to it, no problem. Um, yes, uh, big kids will be wild <laughs> by this too. Uh, I was just earlier today, I was watching videos of the um, uh, SpaceX um, boosters uh, landing side by side on a platform. I've watched it about 100 times, but it still kind of, it throws me every time I every time I see it. Um, it it throws, it, so yes, big kids can get wild too. Wild too, because <laughs> um, we when we take a controls class in engineering school, you know, we we uh, one of the things they they make you you learn is is the inverted pendulum problem. And an inverted pendulum is a naturally unstable system, and it's very hard to control. And that's exactly what SpaceX went with. They went with the 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 most right. difficult controls problem to start with, but they perfected it. They got over time, they figured yeah. out the aerodynamics, they got the gains right to the point that now when you watch it, it's like, Oh, it didn't land. That's now the odd part. Not that it worked correctly. Yeah. 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 And as long as we're on that topic here, we, uh, part of the reason why I was watching it today is cause that, um, uh, correct me if I get any of the details wrong here, uh, and I don't know if, if people were watching the news today managed to find some space news stuck in the middle of all the other bad news going on. But, uh, May 27th, uh, so a month and a week and a half or so from now, um, the first launch of American astronauts from American soil on an American craft since 2011, 2011 uh, July, I think, of 2011, when the shuttle Atlantis went up and essentially 
came down a few days later, a week later, um, and ended the shuttle program. And uh, everyone who's gone up since then has gone up yep. from overseas. Um, so May 27th, if you didn't hear that today earlier, May 27th is when the Falcon 9 is going to launch Crew Dragon from SpaceX from Cape Canaveral. Um, pad 39A, I believe, for those who are really into the Cape. The old, the um, old, very the old pad. Yep, old the old pad. pad. Yep, so uh, American astronauts are going to go up. I didn't, I, I had heard that this is, it was going to be a simple launch with two on board. Is two. it two on board yep. this time, or is it two. They add a third? Yes, okay, two on board. I believe they're going to the space station and then coming um, home. I believe is that going to the space station group? and then coming back shortly. They're not part of the expedition crew. But yeah, very, okay. very. So very that's exciting. that's a big, that's oh, a huge, that's a huge deal. It's, it's no way it's to understate so cool. the importance of that. With an, with yeah. the old so, NASA uh, worm logo on it too, not the meatball. And okay. That got us all excited because it happened on February second, and we're like, "Is is NASA like spoofing us? Is this an April Fool's joke?" But <laughs> so yeah, so there's your news. If you hadn't heard that today, um, an American astronaut launch from with uh, Florida. astronauts. Uh, 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 Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin. Okay, good. I had lost the name, so I'm glad you had those. Um, so yeah, so look forward to that. I'll definitely be doing some more uh, stuff about that as we get closer. I'm seeing uh, uh, Megan yeah, is I asking see. how many rovers have we sent to Mars? So yeah, so we can you count sent, them? Can we uh, name them? Sojourner, Spirit and Opportunity, yep. Curiosity, and then uh, Percy once it gets there uh, next February. Okay, and how many of them are still operating? Uh, just curiosity. Just curiosity. Okay, uh, spirit. Spirit went out before opportunity. Spirit was correct. Spirit was op op spirit was officially blast. gone in two thousand and I think eleven. Some of my some of my okay. newer colleagues may shame me if I get the uh, if I get the name if I get the date wrong. <laughs> oh, I'm um, sure they would. Curiosity do that, uh, no. opportunity. We officially concluded mission in twenty nineteen, but. Um, Likely, we think yeah. that the rover was gone in the early days after the storm hit in 2018. Okay, so as long as, 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 long as we're here, we'll go out of uh, uh, your chronological order for career stuff at NASA. Well, let's stick as long as we're on uh, as long as we're on Mars, as long as we're on Cassini. I'm not Cassini. As long as we're on Mars, we're gonna we're gonna come back to Cassini, and we're gonna talk about your involvement with. Uh, opportunity. Uh, if you're involved in other ones, uh, let me know. But opportunity is the one that I know you were uh, directly involved in. So, um, opportunity rover. I'm going to find a picture here. Uh, throw it up here. So you, we're going to try to oversimplify here. We're going to. I'm going to say. That was a fun day. I love that. Yeah, day. I'm going to say you drove. Op opportunity rover. So a little, a little bit of a distinction. Um, so as a flight director, yeah. So as a flight, as so a flight director, clarify. I'm responsible for the systems engineering, so the spacecraft itself, and making sure that the spacecraft right. uh, stays healthy. And and uh, when we're doing uh, really complicated commanding, that uh, we keep track of what things go up. Kind of think of it like uh, like Gene Kranz, Paul 13, which. Uh, 50 years ago, landed today. Um, so we act very much yeah. in the same kind of way that uh, an Apollo flight director works, except with with spacecraft. So the people that get to uh, the people that get the distinct honor of getting to drive the rovers are called rover planners. Okay. So I never got to drive Opportunity, <laughs> but I got to still do a lot of cool things with it. Yeah. So that picture we just put up there, that tell us about that. Uh, you said that was the coolest day. We have a question on here that from Sophie is the coolest thing you've experienced. And I'm wondering if that picture is the coolest thing you've experienced. Um, that was one of the coolest days that we got to. Um, so right. this picture is from a, a selfie that we took with the microscopic imaging instrument, the MI instrument on the arm of opportunity. Um, so we were trying to think of some really cool sort of social media sort of outreach kind of things we could do with the rover to celebrate 5,000 days for a mission that was only supposed to last 90 days on the surface. Getting to 5,000 is right. was an incredible feat. So we're like, what is something we haven't done yet that could really like get the public interest in this mission again? And we thought, well, we had a uh, uh, one of the, the camera operators on Murr long before he ever came to JPL, his name's Doug Ellison. Um, long before he came to JPL, he had come up with a simulation to do this forensic, um, this uh, this uh, panoramic 
imaging of the rover with the MI instrument. And the reason that it's fuzzy like that is because it doesn't have a, it's just a, it's a, it's a static focal length. So we can't, unlike okay. with uh, Curiosity, we can't, we can't change the focal to kind of bring it in, in focus. Um, so he, he came up yeah. with a simulation long before he came to JPL. And on the day of planning, we had, had pitched this idea of, well, it's Sol 5000. Why don't we take this, this mosaic of the rover? Because no one had ever seen opportunity on Mars. We'd always seen Mars from right. opportunity, but we never actually seen opportunity on Mars. So we thought, well, why don't we give it a shot? Right. And we, we built the sequence, uh, I know that, that I had a, a ton of fun. I know that most of the team had a had a had a blast doing this. <laughs> um, and we're sitting around the next day waiting for the data to come in. And as it starts, as the data starts flowing down from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, our ground tools start putting this thing together, and we just start seeing this image show up. And we're all like, "Holy crap, that's opportunity! That's amazing!" Like yeah. y y you plan it, you simulate it, but yeah. you're like, "Holy crap, it worked!" And it's so cool. <laughs> yeah. So that definitely yeah. was one of the, the highlights. It was definitely a, a very, very fun day um, in my career. And then also this, this image uh, yeah. was another thing we did for Sol 5000. We took a sunrise image on Opportunity's 5,000th day, um, 5, day on, on the surface of Mars, which is just really incredible. That yeah. probably... Yeah, those are some of my favorite pictures, just seeing the, <laughs> the, the, seeing the you know, seeing the... I love, I mean, the selfies that, I mean, Curiosity's gotten very good at that, that, you know, sort of taking a selfie, that opportunity, you know, did that you guys got opportunity to do. Um, but I love seeing these panoramic shots with sunsets or sunrises, because if you looked at them quickly, if you just saw them picture on your phone and your Twitter feed or in your Instagram, you might not realize you're looking at a different planet. And I love the idea that you could almost scroll past it and go, oh, that's a sunrise picture. Oh, that's wait, that's a sunrise from picture from another planet. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. So that that's, day was a lot funny. of fun. I think my favorite experience at JPL was the first proximal ring, ring plane crossing for Cassini because I was the flight controller. Um, I was the first person who saw the data come back from Cassini that said she was she was fine and she had made it through that first ring plane crossing. It was so cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna yeah definitely uh, definitely gonna get to uh, Cassini here, but yeah, I'm glad we could. I think that was Sophie's question, so I'm glad we could cover that. Um, so, moving a rover on Mars is not gonna be like playing Mario Kart at home. It's not gonna be like driving your own car. Um, you're not staring at a screen and hitting the gas pedal, putting on a signal to make sure you don't bump into another rover uh, when you make a left turn. Um, what are you seeing if you're sitting there controlling a rover if you're sitting there running this mission what are you seeing on your screen what is the experience of drive quote unquote driving a rover from that many million miles away like what is yeah, that so look it's like? it's to your point yes it's not like uh, mario kart where you just push the stick forward and you go um just with the time lag yeah. between earth and mars being as high as sometimes 20 minutes and as short as three minutes um, you know, you, you push the yeah. stick to go forward and you wait three minutes, the spacecraft um, gets that signal, it moves forward, and then you have to wait another three minutes to see that it did the thing you wanted it to do. It's not very convenient for doing real-time right. ops. So, so when we say we do real-time operations yeah. at JPL, <laughs> that's, that's kind of a, it's kind of a misconception. Like we, we, we do real-time ops, sure. but everything's not like flying to the moon where the biggest time delay is three seconds. Um, <laughs> the the biggest time delays we can right. have is Voyager, which is somewhere on the order of like 20, 27 hours or something. One way it's it's, it's or uh, twenty hours. It's it's incredible. Um, this, for example, I'm taking a sip here. This, for example, this is not opportunity. This is Curiosity's camera, but I want to throw it up there just to you know to help yeah. visualize what we're what we're talking about. You're not driving, watching this image go by yep. and, and steering like that. But this this I think this was a series of pictures so those, taken. So those images stitched together, on so, but, the left, those are what we call the the Hascam images. So um, the rovers typically yep. uh, Opportunity had two front Hascams. It had two rear Hascams. And then it had two sets of cameras on the top. Think of as like eyes so we can see. One of those are, nav are, are navigation cameras, the other one are panoramic cameras. So we would take images of our surroundings 
And then once we got those images back, we could create a three-dimensional mesh of what the environment around us looked like. And then the rover planners would take that right. information and they would chart a course around the area we're, uh, around where we're at to the point that we want to get to. And say if there's a, uh, there's a really, geologists love rocks. So they find a really fascinating <laughs> rock like over there that they want to go to. So we will take images of our surroundings and we'll plot a course using these images we get from the vehicle to drive over there. And it's a very slow process because we'll take the images around us, we'll downlink them to the ground, we'll get them into our, our system, we'll plot a course, and then we'll drive to another point. We can't necessarily just go straight to it because it may be several hundred meters away and our, our cameras can't resolve features that are that far away. So we'll get the data down, we'll plan the drive, and we'll drive to this next point. Now once we get to that next point, what do we have to do? We have to take pictures. So we take more pictures, we get more surroundings of the area, but the geologists may think, oh, there's something really cool here I want to look at. So we're going to stop and stand a couple days there. We're going to, uh, we're going to get some, we're going to collect some science in this area, and then we're going to plan our next drive. At the same time, we have to conserve battery power. So sometimes, you know, a drive eats up a lot of our battery power. And we have to spend a couple of days here recharging our batteries, doing uh, contact science and remote science before we can drive to the next point. So for, for opportunity, it could take us sometimes, um, in the case of moving from um, Endeavor Crater, or not Endeavor, um, Victoria Crater to Endeavor Crater, I think it took four and a half years to make that drive. It, it was a long, it was a long okay. drive, and there wasn't really a lot there. It was just basically sand dunes. It was this very slow four and a half year drive out there. But um, we ended up getting to a really amazing, uh, very scientifically rich site in this, this crater in Endeavor, which was our uh, what ended up being our final resting, uh, the final point where the rover stopped. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna remove that from there. Okay. Let me uh, see. I know some people had other questions about uh, maneuvering rovers. So let me, uh, um, even just the more basic one, how did you get involved in Opportunity? How did, how do you get picked for a mission like that? What was it that, uh, that was able to get um, So this is around the time Cassini was, was ending and I was looking for my next uh, sort of home afterwards. And uh, um, uh, kind of at JPL, we just, um, we just kind of, use our, our, what we call our group supervisors, our, our direct managers to just kind of, kind of feel out what other projects are needing help and what kind of support they need. And, and, you know, um, yeah, uh, I have, you know, I have a background in engineering, so I have that, that engineering, that brain, that mindset. So I, I understand how to look at a system and how to solve problems like that. Um, so going from Cassini right. to opportunity as a flight director, they had, um, they had an opening, they had a need. Um, and you know, I, I thought when I watched Opportunity Land, one of the things I thought was, wow, wouldn't it be so cool to work on something like that? It's too bad it's going to be gone in three months. It's too bad it's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, then I show up and, and you know, I was yeah. told, oh, there, there's this opening for a, for a systems engineer and a flight director on Opportunity. It's like, that thing's still going? Wasn't the thing supposed to die, like, you know, <laughs> a decade ago? But yeah, it's still going. Um, and they, they had an opportunity and, you know, it just turned out it was a uh, – it was just a great opportunity, ha, huh? opportunity, ha. Huh? Um, and, you know, yes. it, it got me a chance to be, uh, uh, not only get get my hands wet with uh, with systems engineering, actual, like, hardcore rigorous systems engineering at the lab, but also gave me a chance to, um, you know, be a flight director. That was one of the other sort of my, my bucket list goals yeah. working for NASA was I wanted to be a flight controller, I wanted to fly a spacecraft, and I wanted to be a flight director. And I, I now got to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was watching, uh, let me uh, see, I, I can't remember if I had another picture of this or if I put up all the oppie pictures. I think I may have put up all the oppie pictures. We're going to, um, we're going to talk about, um, let me double check that there aren't any other uh, questions jumping in on the side. Make sure we got, we covered the lag time. We talked about the lag time for communicating to Mars. Good. So we got that. Um, Okay, uh, so we have, I'm going to put up this picture, and then this is going to be our intro to talking about Cassini. <laughs> um, so you gave me this picture. Um, you don't think of NASA <laughs> as having an Emmy, 
Um, <laughs> that's not usually if you decide you want to, if what you really want in life is an Emmy, you don't, you know, become a rocket scientist and, and go work for NASA. That's not usually the straight path. Um, but that is our introduction to the Cassini mission. Uh, you're holding an Emmy, which NASA won for its, uh, I mean, you can describe it better, but basically it's presentation <laughs> of the conclusion of yeah. the Cassini mission to one of, Saturn. One of the coolest things I fun. tell people is that I am an Emmy winner and I have the certificate to prove it. Um, yeah. So this this was an <laughs> Emmy that that NASA, uh, that JPL, uh, specifically the communications office won for uh, a, a category called interactive programming. So over the span of about nine months from December uh, I believe it was December 20th was the first uh, F-ring plane crossing. So that was the start of the grand finale up through the final plunge into uh, into Saturn on September 15th of 2017. We had this, they had developed this very, very large social media presence uh, between the articles that they wrote and yeah. uh, the social media presence during the first proximal ring plane crossing and all the, interact all the interactive media that they created. Um, they were in a category with with people like uh, Disney and uh, Marvel movies and all these all these really like big you know uh, entertainment entertainment companies with these big blockbuster movies that had come out the year before and who know NASA uh, a NASA mission ended up winning because we brought the excitement of Cassini mission to the masses it was incredible yeah yeah. Um, so let me get rid of this. We're going to put up uh, so people have a basic <laughs> understanding of uh, of Cassini. Uh, if you again, if you've been involved with any of my events, you've definitely <laughs> seen me talk about um, talk about Cassini. I was uh, not not um, educated and skilled enough to work at JPL. I did have the lucky chance to get selected with a group <laughs> of people to go visit JPL and get a special couple day pass when the Cassini mission was coming to an end in, I think believe that was September, uh, kind of the end of September, 2017. Um, so I got to see the end of it um, right, uh, right there in, uh, in Pasadena. Um, actually, we, we noticed the other day, uh, strangely enough, I actually didn't know him at the time, but I actually took a picture of Michael um, in mission control um, doing his work. Um, didn't really didn't know him at the time, but I, I but uh, I came you know within a few feet of meeting him uh, a couple of years earlier. Um, so Cassini went to Cassini took what seven years to fly to Saturn, and then it spent about thirteen or so um, studying the Saturn system. That's an artist illustration of Cassini there, well, approaching its end yep. as it's really approaching Saturn. Um, but that gives you a little bit of an impression of what that uh, what that spacecraft um, looked like. Uh, so that's a very long mission. For those who were involved from the beginning, people like Julie Webster, um, who were involved from the start. I mean, that's it's you know that's the better part of a of a career, uh, twenty plus years building, flying, managing uh, a project like that. Um, so a little bit. Uh, so the basic idea behind Cassini was to study Saturn, uh, study the Saturn system had a lot of really cool discoveries in especially finding some of the moons uh, that had some interesting things going on. Uh, on a previous video a couple of weeks ago, if you were watching, I uh, had Morgan Cable on here, uh, who is a research scientist out there um, who was searching for life. And we're talking a lot about the moon Enceladus, which has these these, these plumes that, uh, that has underwater oceans. Um, and Titan is a very interesting surface. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff in the system that Cassini helped rewrite textbooks on. Most of what we know about Saturn, I think it's safe to say, comes from Cassini uh, at this point. Um, a lot of research papers probably being written as we speak about um, what Cassini uh, did and didn't find. That'll continue to happen um, for probably the so next in, 25, 30 years. And that'll continue. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a lot. Um, so in a similar vein to um you know controlling a rover um not being like mario kart um flying cassini around saturn is not going to be like uh aircraft you would have gotten in and piloted um so what is it like to be flying 
Cassini, significantly farther away than we talk about this delay of, you know, maybe up to 20 seconds, uh, 20, uh, 20 minutes from uh, Mars. Um, talk about the delay to Saturn. Um, what is it like to pilot? Is it to pilot a spacecraft <laughs> like this? I mean, is it, is it just a whole lot of math coming in? You're just staring at numbers to control? Well, I think like it was this? the coolest job I ever had. It's so much fun. Okay. It's it would have been my so coolest job. That I've, it's um, the coolest job so I've yeah, never had. When, yeah. When you're flying the spacecraft, uh, particularly what we're looking at is just data as it comes in. A lot of engineering telemetry. Yeah. We're basically just monitoring the state of the spacecraft. Now, have to keep in mind, we're monitoring the state of the spacecraft as it was an hour and a half previously because of the time delay between Saturn yeah. and Earth can be upwards as high as 94 minutes. So, you know, it's a big lag. Um but we also do, you know, commanding. We also send, uh, because of how far Cassini is away from Earth, um, our mission operations team would build what we call background sequences, these long sort of eight to 10 week sequences of, of tasks that the spacecraft would execute autonomously on board uh, for those eight to 10 weeks. Um, we would send that's, uh, those kind of files up there, the other kinds of things. Um, I would send commands, actually sending commands to the spacecraft. I was one of only four people in the world who could send commands to that spacecraft. Um, we'd send files to do um, orbital trim maneuvers. So occasionally we have to adjust the orbit of the spacecraft around Saturn because gravity works on anything. Anything that has mass is going to exert a gravitational pull on something else that has mass. Um, so as you're flying around Saturn, you're getting all these little perturbations from the rings and from the moons and, and other types of, of uh, non-uniform gravitational bodies that are just kind of pulling on the spacecraft. And we use uh, we use the DSN to help us navigate around this, around the system. So we we build these these navigation models of where we think the spacecraft is versus where it should be, and we would build these uh, these orbital trim maneuver files to just slightly adjust. Uh, sometimes it was as low as a couple tenths of a meter per second. Sometimes it was as high as uh, 10 meters per second. We'd burn the uh, propellant on the spacecraft and we use that to adjust the, traje adjust the trajectory of the spacecraft and get it back on where it should be. Yeah. So we, I just threw up a couple pictures here. I, they're somewhat self-explanatory, uh, but this is the mission control at a jet propulsion laboratory in Pasadena. Uh, that is Michael and his, at his uh, station, which I suppose it's why it's really sad to think about it but it, it, even not really being involved just visiting but that sign there that says cassini mission ace that's probably not there um, anymore it's not at that console it it's at my desk. okay well that's a decent enough that's a decent desk. enough souvenir um, that's pretty yeah, good yeah so the one on the um, uh, the picture on the yeah. left there that's from the first f ring uh crossing so the f ring is the outermost ring of okay. uh, saturn's ring system um, so that was the first time we got close. We, we made a really close approach to the F-ring. It was the closest we'd gotten to the ring system, I think, since insertion. So it'd been a long time. Um, okay. And then that one on the right is from the first proximal ring plane crossing. That's when we went, we uh, shot the gap between Saturn's atmosphere and the edge of the A-ring going very fast. <laughs> very fast. Yes. So that would be what, when, when people talk about Cassini's grand finale, they're talking, they're not just talking about its actual end. They're talking about its, its series of passes be, in the space between uh, the rings and, and the planet itself, uh, mm -hmm. a bunch of dives uh, in there and which, you know, extremely dangerous maneuver in that no one knows what's in, in that space, uh, any little particle at that speed, you just talked about the incredible speeds are going a very small particle at that speed um could you know drill a hole right through your anything the size going of through and then then your grand finale comes you know, a little we, we, comes a little sooner about the than, energy than particles than is half the mass times the square of the velocity well that means that anything uh the size of a grain of sand moving at seventy thousand miles per hour relative has a wallop of energy and that was one of the things we were most concerned about was yeah um, this, these tiny little grain particles in the rings just smacking right through the middle of the spacecraft and taking out our, our avionics or any other type of system that we need in the spacecraft would, would go kaput. Right. Now, when you make a maneuver like this and you know the, I mean, you're, you, you know, it's not overstating it to say that you're going to, you could get data back that says your mission just, well, the data would, you know, the, 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 the data any moment that could come in. So... 
you again noted you get that flat line that very sad flat okay. line signal that we'll, we're going to talk about in a the minute that, that is what we saw but uh what is that like in the room? How tense is that when you're just, I mean, is like we show that picture of you just kind of standing there looking up, but I mean, is do people just, are people just pacing oh. when there's something like that going on? What is it I, like in the room with the humans? I not think just that the, the, the flight team was pretty nervous. I was, I was calm. I was like, it's, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. The, 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 uh, right. the statistical analysis uh, we had done on the, the hazards of like, what was the likelihood we get hit by something that could destroy it was, was very low. The super low. So, and, and then when we went through the yeah. gap, it turns out that um, that space between it was actually emptier than what our initial guesses were. So, yeah, um, that first pass right. was a little tense because we'd never been through that going those velocities. And, and there was, you know, there was a likelihood we could get hit by something that take the spacecraft out. That's why on the first plunge, we went um, radar dish um, uh, towards the direction of flight. So, radar dish nadir. Um, we used it as kind of a as a shield, as a battering ram, just in case you know there was something okay. <laughs> uh, we you know that just the likelihood that you know we just we use the uh, we use the antenna as a as a shield to take most of the brunt of it so that it doesn't take out the the very sensitive electronics. Right. Okay, that's that's a detail I hadn't had. That's very that's I mean it seems uh it seems logical to do it that way, but to, just that someone had thought about let's orient it uh, that way to uh, hedge our bets a little bit. That's, that's, uh, that's interesting stuff. Uh, so after those dives uh, between the rings, then the mission was to end the spacecraft. Um, Cassini purpose. was ended on purpose. Um, uh, so why don't you talk a little bit about how the decision to end uh, the spacecraft, why that came about, and then um, the very dramatic way you decided to dispose um, so those right. decisions were decided while I was in college. So I just got to see the end result of it, which is really cool. Okay. Um, but as, a, as Dr. Cable <laughs> mentioned a couple weeks ago on your show, um, one of the things we had to do was we had to preserve the bio um, – I always forget this word. We had to preserve the basically the, uh, the moons of Enceladus and Titan from being infected with any potential bacteria we might have brought with us from, uh, from Earth because – there is strong evidence to right. suggest that there could be something really interesting going on at those moons biologically. And we certainly don't want to take our yeah. germs with us, land on, you know, inadvertently crash into Enceladus, come back 30 years later with a mission and say, oh, look, we found life. And then because yeah. <laughs> Cassini hit it, you can't, you can't distinguish between whether life was there to begin with or whether it, it was brought there by Cassini. You just, you can't distinguish. So in order to, to right. keep the, those places um, biologically sterile from our own uh, bacteria, we had to dispose of the spacecraft or we had to either dispose of it or we had to get it out of the Saturn system. One of the things, one of the concepts uh, the mission design team had looked at was to use a series of Titan flybys to throw Cassini out of Saturn's gravity on a very long 40 year, I think a 30 or 40 year cruise to Neptune or something like that. That was one of the things they had considered. Um, but what they ended up coming with from a scientific perspective, you know, if you're going to, if you need to get rid of the spacecraft and you got to go out in a blaze of glory, you might as well do something scientifically very rich. Yeah. So the concept that uh, the mission design team came up with, and it was absolutely brilliant orbital design was they used the uh, gravity of Titan to slowly move Cassini's orbit so that it would pass between the gap of Saturn's atmosphere and that A ring. And it would do this 22 times over the course of, let's see, April, May, June, July, August, September, over the course of about six months. And naturally, the spacecraft would fall into Saturn's atmosphere by Titan without our intervention of any kind. Is a beautiful design. So okay. that first proximal ring plane crossing, yeah. if we didn't hear anything, we, you know, it'd be sad because the mission was over, but we would know that the spacecraft would go into Saturn's atmosphere without our intervention. Beautiful design. Um, right. But it's, it's a good thing that it didn't die on that first pass because we learned so much <laughs> about um, the ring system about the gravity of Saturn, the actual, like the interior distribution of mass within Saturn, things that we could never learn before because we couldn't get there. So we, right. uh, to, to dispose of the spacecraft because we were running out of fuel, 
the the science team went with the option to do this really cool uh, design with the proximal orbits to get us in between that gap. We went and shot through it 22 times, and on the 23rd time, we got a little pull from Titan on that last one that pulled our our periapsis point, our closest approach to the planet, into the planet itself, so that we would dive in, we hit the top of the atmosphere, and just uh, aerodynamic forces by itself would shred the spacecraft. Right. And this all happened at, um, this all happened at, because uh, the, the solar system doesn't operate on a nine to five. Um, this went down somewhere around, what, three or four in the morning, I think, um, Pacific time is our, when the data um, came in. I mean, the, it would have died now. The last, the last <laughs> telemetry back that we got from the spacecraft was time stamped at 4.53.46 a.m. Pacific time. Okay. So, uh, when, you know, talking again about what this kind of looks like, when I was, the room that I, again, lucky enough to be out there, the room that I was in was basically a media room. And we had some, you know, we had some of the mission people in that room with us uh, wearing those purple, those purple Cassini shirts. Um, and up on the screen, we were staring at a signal. And it would look like any, I don't, I, I should have included an example of it here and so I could up, put it up here, but, uh, or my cell phone video of it, but um, it was just a signal with a spike in the middle. Um, and that spike just kind of started dipping and then it would bounce back up again and everyone in the room would cheer and then it would dip and then it would get quiet and then it went back up again and people would cheer. And I remember when that signal finally went down and stayed down uh, meaning that it was that you had you had heard the last that you're going to hear from it. The room went incredibly silent, and all you could tell, all you could, all I could hear was one person way behind me just whisper the word "bye," and it, and it was kind of stunning to see, just know that it was just over, um, just like that. And what is that? I mean, that it was it became a very emotional room all of a sudden uh, with the mission scientists who were in that room uh, with me when I was kind of watching over to how they were reacting to it. Um, at the same time, you, you're talking about a spacecraft that did everything it was built to do and more. Uh, incredible, by every definition, an incredibly successful mission. And it's the ship that you've been flying and babying for a long period of time, some people 20 plus years, um, just gone. It's completely gone. It's not going to land anywhere. It's not going to come home. It's not going to, it's not, you know, it's not Oppie where the battery went dead and maybe someday someone will see it again if they land on Mars or something like that. It's, it's gone. It's completely gone. What is that? <laughs> Happy, sad, both? What, um, what is that? You know, space exploration comes with the drama of it is both highs and lows. There's there's the highs of when you successfully land a rover with a rocket backpack on Mars. And there's the lows when yep. you come to the realization that this solar powered rover that the world loves is is gone and there's nothing you can do about it. It's the same thing with, with Cassini. Um, I think there was a mixture of, of, of joy because we had successfully guided this mission for 20 years to its end. And as you, as you mentioned, one of Julie's, Julie Webster's very, very famous uh, quotes that I, that I just always remember from that, from that morning was uh, the spacecraft did everything we asked her to do right to the very end. She didn't misbehave yeah. at all. Um, now there was, there's a little bit, there's an instrument that decided to, you know, misbehave a little bit that last night, but, um, you know, we, we, we got her all the way to the end and everything just worked spectacularly and it just went off flawlessly. And that's because yeah. of all the work that happens in the background. I think for a lot of the team, it was, yeah. you know, like you said, uh, some people have been on this mission for three years. I mean, we, we literally had, had seen, uh, yeah. you know, uh, engineers when they started on this, you know, they, they had. They had families and we had birthday parties with the Cassini group. And then we'd see their kids grow up and go to high school and go to college. And then they would get married and then they would have kids. You know, it's, you talk about a family. It, it, a lot is right. that Cassini and a lot of these, these missions that last for a long time, you kind of feel like it's a, it's a family. It's, it's, you know, a lot of people with this shared yeah. experience of flying the spacecraft around another planet. And 
it's not a big community that's going. I mean, it's a big. There's a lot of people at JPL, obviously, but in terms of you know sitting at that desk, <laughs> piloting that spacecraft, being on that flight team, that there are no. You're not going to end up at a a restaurant somewhere and just bump mm -hmm. into someone who did that too. It's a it's a tight knit group, I would think that can relate. And I think, like uh, at least for me, and, and probably with a, a lot of the other flight team members, it was, it was the fact that knowing when we came into work on Monday, there would be no new pictures, no new, no new images, no new data. The, yeah. What we got was, that was it. Those were the last images. We weren't going to get anything new. Yeah. And those were the last images we were going to see yeah. of Saturn from that perspective for another 20, 30 years. Yeah. I think about that when I use my uh, telescope uh, looking out in Saturn. It's one of my favorite, uh, uh, Saturn and Jupiter are two of my favorite, probably my two favorite targets to look at. And I think of that when I'm looking at this gorgeous view of Saturn and I'm thinking, well, I wish I had a Cassini picture. I wish I had a new Cassini picture because it's a little better than what I'm getting right here through my telescope. It's nice through my own eye, but um, uh, it, it is weird to think that there isn't another data dump coming from from Cassini, you got spoiled by uh, by the pictures uh, that it was providing. Um, let me uh, see. I'm trying to see if I threw up that last. Uh, I want to make sure I included a bunch of pictures. Uh, yeah, here, just real quick. The, this uh, this uh, on the screen here. That's uh, Michael uh, uh, at his station as well. I took this picture of him without knowing who he was at the time. Uh, but I included this picture just uh, just because I, I not uh, what's funny about it is uh, that I'm doing exactly what everyone on the other side of the table is doing, which they're all just leaning in, taking pictures, uh, wondering what it's like to, to control this. So uh, so I want to include that. Uh, I want to throw that picture up there just because it's mine, just because I took that one. That, that's my own my own picture from being in the room. Uh, uh, I haven't it's been the coolest job like I've ever before, had. So. Maybe there'll uh, be another <laughs> maybe there'll be another cool job like that. Yeah. Down the road. Someday. There'll be, there'll be another one, I'm sure. So um, let me, I'm going to look at glancing at my phone here because on my phone I have a list of some other questions. I want to make sure I get to other questions people um, asked about. Um, one uh, one question someone had was, um, you know, if you got, you, you, you've you been on Mars with a rover and you've been around the Saturn system with Cassini, um, if you got to pick a mission, he said, you know what I really wish we would spend our money on? I really wish we would send a spacecraft here. I really wish we would go investigate that. Or I personally really want to go fly there or drive there. What what type of mission do you hope um, comes? Or is, is it already in the planning stages? Are you lucky enough that it's actually being um, The mission together? I would love to see funded is a flagship type mission that Cassini was that goes to Enceladus and goes into orbit around Enceladus and land something on those southern at uh, the south pole where those vents are where we can actually touch that ocean and see what's going on down there go for a swim Inter go for a swim Mor morgan and i were talking about finding um <laughs> in cell dolphins in, in terms of in there, terms so. of places like where we may have the best chance to find life in our solar system yeah. It's, it's, it's the coolest spot in the solar system. It's That's got an I've ocean always, spraying out into space. It's literally telling us something really cool is going on here. Come look, come look here. And one of the amazing things about it is that um, I think there's always this perception that, well, I mean, NASA has all this great tools and we've got these amazing telescopes and we've got all this cool stuff out there. I'm, I'm sure we kind of knew about all this stuff before and then maybe we get closer and we get a better look. Enceladus was giving off if i'm trying to remember a little bit from what i've learned I, it was giving us some reason to believe there might be something interesting there but the idea of these plumes the pictures that were coming in um mm -hmm. caught people off guard at least to the extent the science, that the what science was team was happening the science team was, was totally a surprise yep truly a discovery yeah truly a there discovery were, it was it's like it, you flew to saturn and you go, oh yeah look it has rings well we knew that we didn't know there were little had that pieces of information out, over the span of 10 years of observations that were telling the science team that something really interesting was going on there which is why enceladus got more follow-up yeah. study in the extended missions uh, for cassini is enceladus needs more follow-up study because there's yeah. something really interesting going on there yeah yeah, I'm looking to see if I have a uh, 
I don't know if I have one. I'm just saying, trying to see if real handy. If I have one real handy, a real handy picture of uh, of Enceladus here. See if I can get that to uh, pop up. I'm trying to trying to upload a picture <laughs> while I'm actually uh, doing this. So we'll see if this is going to work. This might be uh, one level of coordination greater than I actually have in my in my brain here. See if that pops up. Uh, let's show this up here on the screen. So that's that's the moon the we're talking moon. about. That uh, that's in solid. It's very the Hoff moon. It's very it's a very cool moon. Uh, yeah. So there there's a lot of there's a lot of hope that maybe there's a the, if you're looking for life uh, if you're looking for any kind of signs of life around our solar uh, around you're not just talking about exoplanets. You're not just talking about the ones that are so far away. It's hard to even imagine. You're just seeing blips. Um, on a screen, uh, but this this is local um, as far as uh, the solar system solar system goes. And actually, I have a better one here. I'm able to pop there's it that. real quick. Um, there's the plume. So if you want to talk about uh, a little bit uh, a little bit about that, I mean that picture pops in, and everyone's just, just what is it? it? Looks like it's trying to fly. It looks like Enceladus doesn't want anything to do with Cassini. <laughs> it's trying to fly away. <laughs> So That's this image probably like. is taken at a uh, high, uh, uh, what's the word, a high incidence angle. Um, so we can only see it okay. through backscattering light from, or from forward scattering light from the sun. So um, in backscattering light, which is if you take a picture of something and the backscatter of the light that comes back to the lens, that's what we call backscattering. In forward scattering, we're looking at the light as it yeah. passes through the image towards the lens. And the only way you can really see the Enceladus sure. plume, we, we call this a uh, cold faithful. This is at the at the south pole of Enceladus. You can only see it <laughs> in that forward scattering light. And and uh, this image wasn't actually they didn't know that this was going on until we had done some passes of Enceladus and had noticed that there was this this temperature, this thermal anomaly at the south pole of, of Enceladus. And then as they look back as at these high incidence sure. angles, they they saw this and they're like, well, that's cool. Let's go back. Let's go. Let's that's, go back there. That's worth looking at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, let me. Uh, I'll hide. Uh, I love that that picture. I knew I had it on my computer here. I knew. I knew I had a lot of. I knew I could find some and sell those pictures pretty quickly on my computer. It's full of them. Um, so let's uh, you know, glancing over here. We talked about like a favorite mission. So that's how we got it. I was trying for how do we get back on the Celadus? That's right. We're talking about like a favorite mission. That would be that would be cool. Yeah, I, I, that would be very high on my list. Checking my list of questions here. Um, we uh, someone posted it just just to make sure I don't. I want to make sure I don't forget it. Someone had a question on the side here. Uh, Claudia, uh, who is seven wanted to know I uh, wanted to tap into that idea of maybe become an astronaut and uh, wanted to get some advice for someone who's seven um, to maybe be an astronaut someday um, what would you tell Claudia about being uh, an astronaut? this is something I have been thinking about for a long time uh, going over two decades so um, it's a long process um, but a lot of the things I have done in my life, particularly my education, my, my job, my career choices were driven by that sort of desire to become an astronaut. But what I found in that pursuit is that even if I don't make it, I've still done a lot of really cool stuff in my career. But uh, you don't want to say for someone who's a budding astronaut that wants to think about this, like, um, be curious. That was my biggest thing. Is, is you know, I, I went to the I went to the Kansas Cosmosphere, and you know, they had things on the V two rockets, and they had things on Apollo, and they had things on uh, the Gemini mission, all this, and the space shuttle, and all these all these really cool things. And you know, we uh, you go to space camp, and we talk about rockets, and we talk about robotics, and I got really interested in those kind of things. So what what did I do? Um, I built my own rockets in my parents' basement sometimes to the ire of my mother, but, uh, um, yeah, I built rockets. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I was on the robotics team. Um, I just did a lot of, a lot of like a lot of those STEM activities that, uh, mostly because I just found them interesting. I, I was, I was really into astronomy. I was really into, uh, to the sciencey classes in high school. I loved chemistry. I loved physics. Um, I had an, an amazing physics, uh, instructor in high school that, uh, kind of really, you know, helped me, uh, 
I, I think kind of solidified like, yeah, um, I think I can handle engineering because if I can do the physics and I can do the calculus, then I could definitely get through it. Um, mathematics is big. You gotta, you just gotta know how to do numbers. Um, you gotta know how to do mathematics. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, um, engineering as a, as a career is very, is fundamentally based in the physics of nature. And a lot of that is based on, um, mathematics. We can use mathematics to express, uh, a natural phenomenon in nature. So, you know, you have to be good at, have to be good at math, have to be good at science. Um, but just, just be curious, like, and, and go with it, have fun. Um, I, I learned a lot of things about aerodynamics and rocketry just from, just from building rockets and, and learning things about like, you know, if I, if I mix these particular chemicals, I get this kind of reaction and I get more thrust out of it. Or, or, you know, I make, uh, if I make right. the rockets, uh, uh, slender, versus the width you know like it it's more stable than if it's you know if it's if it's uh fatter and shorter you know just little things of, of experimenting and just you know going through you know the sort of understanding the physics of things just with my own experimentation and i was a huge space nerd when i grew right. up like i watched paul 13 i watched october sky um you can probably see the you see the picture you see the picture oh, like that like, uh, oh, yeah. We, yeah october sky i'm glad you mentioned october sky that's a yeah, and the, I, I'll, you know, the I'll biggest thing is just, just don't give up. It's a long, <laughs> it's a long process. Um, but you know, even if you don't make it, there's still so many amazing, amazingly cool things you can do in the space industry that contribute to, to space exploration, whether it's, you know, flying a spacecraft around Saturn or operating a river on Mars or, you know, uh, Pretty good consolation prize yeah. if you didn't end up becoming an astronaut, that part of you getting you there was to fly yeah. around Saturn and, and yeah, work on I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's still a very rewarding career. Yeah. And uh, I, even just, um, you know, you're talking about just being curious and doing simple things. I mean, even just the, I mean, there's a million things you can do, but even just the, uh, the basic building paper airplanes and figuring mm -hmm. out which ones are going to fly farther and um, using stomp rockets and, and pushing, playing around with the angles at which you hit and the force at which you hit, th that's going to tell you, things it's that are going to lead to something else i mean it's simple simple things when you're seven and you're working on stuff just yeah just yeah. just try things play uh give it a go see what's fun see where you learn something see what was interesting follow something to the next follow one thing for, to the next, for, uh, for to budding the next thing. nasa um, astronauts people that want to apply to the nasa astronaut program um the the requirements you, you have to have a degree in stem so whether it's engineering uh a science um mathematics um a medical degree something of that kind um the new requirement now is a master's degree which was a bit different than a lot of the previous application cycles it was just a bachelor's degree was the minimum requirement they um headquarters they bumped up the yeah. requirements to a master's degree um and the requirement is just two years of experience beyond your uh beyond your master's degree two years of qualifying experience um okay. so you know you can do it in anything i mean uh NASA has, they have test pilots, they have engineers, they have uh, doctors, they have biologists, they have chemists as astronauts. So, you know, when, when you're talking about going yeah. to Mars on a long-term mission, you know, what you're looking for is, you know, a well-rounded crew that knows a lot of different things and can contribute wholly to right. that mission. So, um, you know, whoever they pick in this next cycle, uh, the second ge Artemis generation class, they're going to be amazing people and they're going to contribute they're going to do incredible things yeah. for human space by definition. By definition, by 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 resume, by resume alone, going to be, these are going, going to be, be the most amazing. People. And NASA is is going to have an incredible group of people to lead that that next charge into back into deep space to the towards the moon, and then you know back to Mars. Yeah. Yeah. And for, you know, so I, um, I, I always, uh, when I was a kid, I certainly dreamed of being an astronaut. And then I had this thing, um, where I was just, I get horribly motion sick at just anything. I stare at my phone too long. I get motion sick. <laughs> I'd be a horrible person to be at. You wouldn't want to fly anywhere with me, uh, to another place. But, you know, so if you're, if you're kidding, you want to study these things, study these things, figure out what you really like, get into it. Um, you know, I, we talked, we br briefly talked about winning, you know, NASA winning an Emmy for its work. Uh, clearly, if you don't feel like being an astronaut, if you don't have the astrophysics, 
there's people at NASA who are doing communications. There's people at NASA who are just studying uh, uh, and getting messages like this out. They're literally winning Emmys for their work. NASA can take, well, can NASA's for looking for the best people. You have a um, passion for the work. So, so you, you're a passion. Yeah, if you have a passion, passion for go that, for it. That we do, you know, there's a place for you. We have, we have graphic designers, we have graphic artists, we have, uh, we have videographers, we have photographers, we have uh, writers, we have all sorts of people that, that work here. We have social media specialists that yeah. manage our, our, our mission sites yeah. to keep people engaged and, you know, show them what the, what the mission is doing, what the crew and what the team's doing. And it's, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots yeah. of space for people to work at NASA, even if you aren't an engineer. Yeah, or there's lots. Right. Uh, oh, real quick, I just noticed it popped up. Um, the name the, of that museum the in Kansas, Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center www.cosmo.org they're currently shut down right now because of uh coronavirus but um it, it is it is truly a gem of the state of kansas um, i'm gonna make a plug i'm from kansas so um it's 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 a gem i mean there is <laughs> there are some absolutely fascinating things yeah. um, one of the things i got to do uh two years ago was i was invited as part of a panelist for the apollo 8 50th anniversary and you know the cosmosphere is so well known that okay. they they were able to get uh, Jim Bridenstine, the NASA administrator, came in. Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, um, yeah. Glenn, uh, Glenn Lunny, um, uh, Charlie Duke, Moonwalkers, Apollo astronauts, just all these amazing people that they can just bring in. It's because the cosmosphere just is it's just there. You wouldn't think of it in the middle of a the middle of Hutchinson, Kansas, and <laughs> but it's there, and it's it's yeah. just an incredible place to go to. I've been to a whole bunch. I've been lucky enough to go to a whole lot of events um, with Jim Lovell um, and managed to not meet him any of the times that I've been at those events. I have a really good streak going now of how many times I can manage to not meet Jim Lovell. Um, so hopefully, uh, I mean, I, I, it's a good streak. It's like seven events in a row that I've managed to not meet him. But one of these days, I'll, I'll, I'll un unfortunately, I'll unluckily break, break that streak. Probably I'll be getting a drink at a water fountain and bump into him as opposed to actually meeting him. It was, it was really neat at that Apollo 8 event because we, we, uh, we went on a tour of the facility with, uh, with the astronauts and all the, all the VIPs and stuff and, and went out to the, the Cosmosphere's restoration facility, uh, which actually, uh, they restored the Apollo 11 consoles for mission control. It's the only, only real museum in right. the world that NASA would trust to restore these these historic consoles in time for the Apollo 11 mission and uh we yeah. were i was talking with with charlie charlie duke and his wife dotty about uh about the opportunity rover and they wanted a picture with me because their grandkids would absolutely love to know that <laughs> grandpa met a mars rover driver i thought that was really cool it's like oh yeah I was like, oh, you know, I'm I'm really I'm geeking out over you know hanging out with with astronauts, and they're geeking out because oh my my grandkids would would love to know that you know this is someone who drives a rover on Mars. <laughs> yeah, I told I think I told this, I think I told if I remember I told this when I was with with I'm with Morgan I think I'm trying to remember, but I um when I was out there uh, in Pasadena I ended up talking to this guy. Uh, I didn't know who he was. His name tag on his lapel was like turned around backwards. And I, so I couldn't see what his name was. And we really we literally just ended up standing in the same corner of the room at the same time. And I kind of didn't know anyone there and I didn't know who to talk to. And this guy just started a conversation with me. He asked me why I was there, what I was doing, where I was from. I started telling all this stuff about how I really like telescopes. And I'm from Chicago and I help out at the Adler Planetarium and I do this really cool stuff. What do you do? And I realized I was talking to Charles Alaki, um, Alashi. Who was whose name is literally on mission control? Mm -hmm. I had no idea who I was who I was talking to, and I got a great picture with him. But it's um, it's funny to uh, that that he seemed thrilled that someone from Chicago who likes telescopes was out in Pasadena to talk about Cassini when mm -hmm. I just about fell over at mm -hmm. when I realized who I was who I was talking. To. And I think it's just uh, passion begets passion. Um, that if you if you're really interested in this stuff, you're going to find people who are interested with you, and they just want to talk about it. They just want to do something with you. They want to learn something from you. So I think that's that's uh, that's really neat. Um, in the last minute or so before we get going, don't want to keep you too long tonight. Um, 
what can you tell us about what you're working on now? I know you kind of mentioned it briefly, some of your stuff, but uh, what, what, what's coming up? What are you going to be, uh, what are yeah, we going to so, see your name um, on? What I'm future? currently working on is, is a mission called NISAR. Um, that is... Mm -hmm. that the climate... Uh, yep, we, we have this uh, spacecraft radar, with this yeah. giant radar, and we deploy this radar, and we create um, this, this large radar aperture on a synthetic, uh, as a SAR is called, a synthetic aperture radar. Um, we create this large synthetic radar swath of the Earth, and every... Uh, Every 20 or so some days, we make a complete uh, map of the world. And we basically are tracking things like ice melting and um, ocean temperature changes and land mass changes and just things to kind of look at what the climate of, of how, how the climate of, of Earth is changing because the, the Earth is a very complex dynamic system and it's always changing. So, you know, we like to know what the Earth is doing. One of the things that, you know, can help yeah. with uh, future pandemics is understanding what the climate of the, of the earth is doing because that can inform what viruses are doing and what different types of diseases are doing. And we can track sort of those, how those work. And it's all just understanding how the, how the climate of the planet is, is, is changing because it's dynamic. It's always changing. And this, this term of climate change, well, the climate's always changing. It's a dynamic system. It's just climate takes a long time to change. Whereas, you know, weather patterns are very local and isolated and they, they come and go. Um, so I'm, I'm with that mission yeah. for uh, another couple of weeks here. Um, I, I actually just, um, my, uh, my uh, fiance and I were, were moving to Virginia. We, we both got uh, transfers out to, uh, to Virginia. So my next mission, um, I will be working on the lunar lander and the, the lunar gateway mission. So uh, the Artemis program, the next, uh, the next pieces of the Artemis mission. So uh, um, the gateway, which is, um, this uh, sort of mini, mini space station that's going to stay in cis lunar orbit around the moon and it's going to be there as sort of a, an autonomous outpost for astronauts to to, to spend uh, for up to 30 days um, I'm, I'm sure nasa's headquarters is always working on what the, the actual plan is going to be but it's it's just going to be like this mini space station around around right. lunar orbit and it's going to be used as a as a way to to, to test um deep space, long-term sort of habitats for, for astronauts as they go out to, to the moon or as they, as they go out to Mars eventually someday. Um, and um, what I'm going to be doing is yeah. what's called fault management. So fault management deals with uh, when your spacecraft doesn't behave, when it does something it's not supposed to do. Fault management is a system that's used to detect and isolate bad things from propagating from where the bad thing happened to other systems and keeping the system safe. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that, so yeah, the, that's uh, the general, you know, we, you, you, it's not about you build a rocket, you put people on it, you send them to Mars, you call it a day. There's infrastructure involved. There's a setup, there's a process and gateway that little, that, that <laughs> lunar outpost essentially orbiting outpost is, is, uh, mm -hmm. is a big part of that. So that'll be, uh, that'll be interesting. Um, I just, uh, just grabbing here, question on the side. Books or autobiographies you would recommend to a 13-year-old to continue their passion for space? And as someone is uh, recommending a book that I certainly recommend, which is um, the Home Rocket uh book, uh, which, which, which Rocket Boys, which became October Sky. Uh, I recommend the book okay. and the movie. Um, but uh, any... Beyond, uh, uh, beyond just, Rocket Boys, uh, what do you got? So I you really think? enjoyed Mike Massimino's autobiography. I thought it was very well written. Mike Mike Massimino, uh, as, uh, former shuttle astronaut, uh, went to Hubble. Uh, I think the last Hubble service mission. He's okay. he's just he's got a great personality. He's really funny, and that really that really shows in his book. Um, Scott Kelly's uh, autobiography is also a very a, a very good um, autobiography uh, of an astronaut, uh, Mike Mulvaney, another NASA astronaut, very good. Um, a lot of the space books that I enjoy kind of relate to to history. So um, Werner von Braun, there's a lot of books written about Werner von Braun and um, you know his contributions. There's a uh, there's a lot of great books about the shuttle era and how the shuttle program kind of came into existence. Um, yeah, it's there's there's no shortage of really really neat. Uh, space books that are out there to, to inspire you. And one of my favorite yeah. space books to read is The Martian because it is so funny. It's one of my favorite books to read. I, I try to read it almost every year because it's, it's just so funny. Yeah. The Martian is, uh, Martian the Martian is a favorite. Uh, Artemis is very good. Book. Um, not as, I, I would say yeah. it, it wasn't as great as The Martian, but it was still really good. It is, is really funny. You can, um, both really great books by anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And, and it's always an interesting um, thing. Uh, you see different fiction out there. And uh, from everyone that I've talked to, people at JPL, they love just the love The Martian. It's, it's like it's universal. It's one of those, it's not even a debate. And if you're really JPL into sci-fi and for some of the more of the, the older adult readers, um, The Expanse. I love The Expanse series. It's, it's so good. Yeah. Oh, and I see Scott. Scott here yeah. uh, put up yeah. New Horizons by Alan. Yeah, Alan Stern. New Horizons. Yeah. Excellent. Very good. One of the uh, when I was out there at JPL, one of the people who was out there, uh, NASA does these things. I might as well plug it too. I guess why not? Mm-hmm. Called NASA Socials. I suppose they're not they're really not doing gonna... them at the moment. Um, but, but they do these things called NASA Socials. Uh, I'm sure they're on other. I found it on via Twitter. I'm sure find it on other other social media on the website but nasa socials where you apply a uh, really simple online application um to get picked to go they'll announce that hey they're going to do a launch uh, next month they're going to do uh this type of uh, research two months from now at goddard or they're going to be at jpl for something or in my case the cassini finale and you just apply you don't have to have a master's <laughs> You don't have to be aspiring to any of those things. You don't have to have those degrees. Um, they're just looking to bring people in who want to experience firsthand what NASA is doing um, and share your experiences. That's why it's called NASA Social. Share it on social media. So they're looking for people with social media platforms. That's how I got to go to JPL was I simply applied through an application into the dark and got lucky enough to get picked. And uh, so I want to uh, point that out, that that's something people should look at if they're serious about this stuff, is NASA socials are, are wonderful. One of these days, I'll get to go to a launch. That's kind of my next on my list. Yeah. I got to see you crash a spacecraft. I would like to see what launch now. I think that's 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 where I'm at. But uh, one of the people who was there with me for the NASA social was one of the head writers for The Expanse. Yeah. And um, I was almost as fascinated with her as I was with, <laughs> with what I was seeing in the room. It's like, oh, wait, someone's from The Expanse. Well, if you can get to the, um, if you can get to the Mars so yeah, 20 launch, that, that's going to be spectacular. You want to put in a good word for me? I will. I am not, I'm not shameless, uh, shameless on that. So whatever. Um, so I'm trying to think if I had any other questions. I don't think I had any other, uh, lingering questions for people. Um, uh, if you're joining later, I do want to make sure that people know that the news from today, the big news from today, which is that American astronauts from American soil on an American spacecraft launching May 27th from Cape Canaveral. So put that on your calendar. Uh, you're going to want to, uh, you're going to want to check that out. Um, and your, your kids, depending on how old they are, um, have, have, if they've seen a shuttle launch, it was on tape <laughs> or what we used to call I think tape. Very long um, I think 39. so uh, from 39A. So, uh, it, it's something to experience. You're going to want to, uh, tune in for that. Um, I will certainly be holding some sort of event. I don't know if people will be doing gatherings at that point or not, whether I'll be able to hold an event and have people around for a watch party. But uh, if you follow my social media at all, keep an eye out because I definitely will be doing something around that launch. Um, one other little piece of business, if you enjoy this kind of stuff and if you enjoy telescope stuff, next Friday I have, once again, I'm bringing back the Director of Public Observing for the Adler Planetarium to talk all about telescopes. We talked about telescopes last week, but we're gonna get into the more details of building them, putting them together what pieces do what. So if, you, if you're enjoying watching these types of things, keep an eye on my Facebook and other social media. Next Friday, same time, same place, I'll be talking with her. Um, and I think uh, I think that is everything. Thank you so much for taking, you took almost an hour and a half of your evening uh, out there, uh, Michael. So thank you so much for spending yeah, uh, no so much time for us. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, cool. Well, thanks everyone for joining and watching. Uh, the other reminder is that if you didn't see this, if you know someone who would be interested in this particular video um, or you missed part of it, the moment that I cut this off, it uploads right to my Facebook page. The whole video will be there. You can go back and watch it. Also, if you give me maybe an hour or so to, you know, dinner, which I haven't had, um, I will upload it onto my YouTube channel, my very, very, very small one subscriber YouTube channel. Um, but you can, uh, the video will be found there if you're not a Facebook person and you're looking for someone who just wants to find it on YouTube. Um, so I will have it there, but keep your eye out. We will have more of these as long as we're all stuck inside. Might as well talk to people here. So thank you so much again for, uh, 
for watching and thank you for joining us here. And uh, that is uh, the end of our end of our thing. Uh, as I try to you know remember which button to hit that actually ends our thing. But um, pop this up. And thank you very much, everybody.